So far, it is a war of words, but could the worrying rhetoric between North Korea and the United States escalate into something more serious? Is North Korea more dangerous now than ever before? This is a round table with me, David Foster. North Korea's plans to fire missiles near the U.S. territory of Guam has infuriated the United States with an angry exchange of threats from both sides. And this week, a joint military exercise between the U.S. and South Korea is underway. The annual military drills have been described by Pyongyang as foolish, a dress rehearsal for war. <laughs> It's a crisis that has persisted for years. Two countries continually on the brink. And a war of words with the world's only superpower. Things will happen to them like they never thought possible. After the highly charged rhetoric of recent days between the US and North Korea, some of the smoke has cleared. But it's not over yet. Has this confrontation reached new, more dangerous levels? A secretive, isolated country. Almost half the population lives under the poverty line and there's a chronic shortage of food. Infrastructure is outdated. It's doubtful that North Korea could withstand an attack from the outside. But in this tightly controlled state, the threat of imminent war. Defiance against the West, particularly the US, has defined its foreign policy for 70 years. And clear signs, it's not just bluster. North Korea has conducted 18 missile tests so far this year, perfecting the technology with each launch. And five nuclear tests over the last decade, each one more successful than the last. But perhaps the most concerning development for the US and its regional allies, unverified reports Kim Jong-un's regime has finally succeeded in miniaturizing a nuclear weapon that could fit onto a missile. For Pyongyang, its nuclear weapons program is key to its survival. They see the US, a nuclear power stationed across the border in South Korea, as a clear threat. But if North Korea's main goal is preservation, then attacking the US would be highly risky. Threatening to fire missiles towards Guam, the US territory, is the latest in its political brinkmanship. The crisis has been made worse now by a new unknown quantity, Donald Trump and the world waits to see whether he'll back up his heated words with weapons of war. It's not clear if the long-term strategy with Pyongyang will be diplomacy, containment, or direct confrontation. For now, underneath the saber rattling, it seems, everyone is sticking to the status quo. But the danger is that even a small provocation could trigger a wider conflict. And the risks of a miscalculation from either side would end in disaster. With me at the round table today, well, not physically, but actually in Malta, Andreas Engstrom, a delegate of the Korean Friendship Association, which uh, wants to improve ties with the North. He believes the US is the biggest threat to world peace. On my right, activist and critic of what he calls the US imperialist system, Sukhan Chandan who believes North Korea's nuclear ambition is a safeguard against America. To my left, Mark Seddon, former speechwriter and communications advisor to Ban Ki-moon, uh, who's been to North Korea on a number of times. We'll talk about that. He believes that while sanctions have their place, the UN needs to facilitate bilateral talks between North Korea and the US. And we have New York Observer columnist Andre Walker, who describes North Korea as a schoolyard bully and says America should not back down. Thank you very much indeed for coming on Roundtable. Uh, first question, and this is to all of you, including you, Andreas, um, in Malta. 
raise your hand or shout, uh, depending on your or answers. Who believes that war is inevitable? I, I think it's... Do you th I don't think it's inevitable necessarily. I think the issue here is that... Um, Kim Jong-un has changed the policy of his father and his grandfather. His father and his grandfather just wished to threaten Seoul with bombing. He believes that the way to maintain his dynasty now, his evil, ruthless dynasty, is to have an intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile. That is something that will not be allowed to happen. But then again, he's already backed down. Hang on, I don't want, I don't want the big picture here. Okay. I'm just asking, is war inevitable? No. I don't think it's inevitable. Uh, I, I, if, if people think that, then I'm afraid you'd sleepwalk into that sort of situation. Now is the time for action, and especially from China and the United States and the United Nations. And I think, yeah, there are ways of ensuring that this does not happen. But this coming week is a, a real test of where we go next. Well, I absolutely, think. Mark, because, I mean, the, just before we came on air, there was a statement from North Korean regime saying uh, uh, Trump is pouring gasoline on the fire, that this is a reckless behaviour, or this is reckless behaviour, driving the situation into the uncontrollable phase of nuclear yeah. war. I think, I think, but I think the I historical think roots of all of this... Andres, come to you in just a second. Sorry, we, we, yeah. we can't see you sometimes. You'll, you'll be next. The, the people right. of East Asia, including the Korean people after the Second World War, they, were, they freed themselves under, from Japanese, Japanese colonial occupation. They, it was a united country, it became a socialist country, quite similar to Vietnam and some other uh, But it's East, not the East history Asian I want, and this is what I said no, but, to but, but, but the, po said, the point is that the Korean, war, the Korean war in the 1950s, which was conducted by the United States, and 80,000 British army personnel, which killed up to 5 million Korean people within three years and partitioned the country, that conflict actually hasn't ended yet. And the conditions for further conflagration of the conflict, are all the ingredients are there, particularly uh, increasingly vicious leadership in Washington that's clearly fascist. I mean, Steve, Steve Bannon, who's just left the White House, actually, he wants to shift the, the tensions not against, I mean, Bannon is a fascist leader, he wants to uh, develop the, the tensions not against North Korea, but against China. But he's been replaced by uh, war hawk generals who will actually develop the threat of war on the Korean Peninsula. But the, but the Koreans have this, they, ha they have this weapons program because they've seen what happened to Iraq under Saddam, they've seen what happened to Gaddafi under Libya, and they consider well, let, that let's, this let's is the only safe They, they had the weapons program long before Gaddafi and what happened in Iran. So, I mean, that, that predates that, this nuclearization. But, 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 but let, let's, go yeah, to, like, let's go to Andreas. Um, a carrot and stick, Andre here said, uh, the carrot hasn't worked, it's time for the stick. So what do you think is going to happen next? Like, the thing is, like, just to get back to your, your statement there, uh, that there's been, like, um, uh, a development of nuclear weapons uh, within the DPRK, of course. But you know yourself that the U.S. have mounted South Korea with nuclear weapons up until the 90s. So that was, of course, like a reaction to that, that, that as well. Uh, but I think now war is not in the, in inevitable, of course, but it's all up to, like, Trump. And the thing is, Trump is very competitive, and that, that's like the main problem. Sorry it's to say, Andres, we, we have a little sound issue with um, your Skype connection, but uh, we'll try and sort that out and uh, bring well, Mark back in. I, I'll just say, I mean, I, I've been to North Korea several times. I've met some of the uh, political and military leaders, um, not the current one, Kim Jong uh, un, um, but uh, Kim, Kim Jong Nam, who's the, still the president of the National Presidium, I think essentially North Korea is still traumatized from the Korean War. There's no doubt about that. Uh, South Korea has moved in a different direction. The countries are very, very different now. But the, um, but there is a real, real uh, issue there. I think that uh, essentially the North Koreans see this as being a form of self-defense. Having nuclear weapons provides them with this. So the big question is, how do you get around that? And how do we get... Because you mentioned the a conflict. The conflict ended, of course, but what there has never been is a peace agreement between the United States and North Korea. If that can somehow be facilitated, and this is where, oddly enough, uh, Trump could learn something from Nixon, if Trump were to say, right, I want to have direct talks with North Korea, I want to go straight... As Nixon did with Mao, it's just possible... And that's what the Koreans are that. demanding. That's Pyongyang's that's demand. That's what they Absolutely. wanted all along. That's right. They have wanted that. But it, will, it makes good sense for all sides now to have this it, happen. Is your stick, uh, which you think is much more important than the carrot, or, or certainly the alternative to the carrot right now, Andre, is it the new uh, Security Council resolution uh, well, that's just I'm, been put in place? I'm not. I'm not. Which, I'm... which leaves it open if there's denuclearization, yeah. scaling back of the nuclear programme, 
for there to be talk. I, I, th I think my more general point is this. And by the way, I think UN resolutions are worth having. I'm not a complete opponent of UN resolutions, but I think they rarely uh, succeed. I think the more, ge the, more general, the more general issue is this. Look, what we have been doing with Kim Jong-un for decades is that every time, uh, well, the Kim regime, rather, every time they threaten the West, every time they threaten Seoul, what we do is give them a bag load of money. And we, as it stands today, although hopefully the sanctions will change this, we allow him to sell slavery around the world. These sort of, these, these groups of people that go and work in foreign countries are basically slaves. Um, people are selling themselves for $100 a time on the border with China. And my argument is very simply this. Why are we continuing to do this? He knows that if he sabre rattles, he'll get a bag load of money and that would have been true under Barack Obama but I think it's not true under Trump so I say simply this you make the point and it's only fair for everyone to understand that if you attempt to attack Guam you are going to be hit back as long as he is Andre, as long as he's clear there's, there's about no that, bag of money I mean I think you're getting a bit carried away I mean it is absolutely clear that the world wants this state to denuclearize and it also wants to see I mean obviously the North Koreans want to see denuclearization in the south That's right. uh, the whole Korean peninsula needs to become denuclearized right. does the regime get rewarded there's a trickle of stuff that comes in from China there's no, and, I, and I also agree with you to a degree that some of the sanctions have not been strong enough in the past but they are now and the very important development was China and Russia supporting the last Security Council resolution. You have actually got tr Trump, oddly enough, you might say this is down to him being tough, has actually achieved what some previous administrations have failed. So now having got to that stage, it would make sense because I understand that um, uh, you have a, a regard for Steve Bannon. Well, oddly enough, Steve Bannon said that there is no military solution. He gets that. Um, and he's not my cup of tea, but he gets that. Ah, but it depends. And on I, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you for a second because he had a really good say just now. We've uh, redialed Malta, and we have Andreas <coughs> Engstrom there again, who was shaking his head as uh, Andre <laughs> was speaking. But I also want to ask you, what, whatever point it is that you want to make, do make it. But the Korean Friendship Association uh, ties with North Korea. Uh, how's that going? Uh, good. Like, uh, of course, like we're a friendship association, and um, yeah, we're we're doing our thing. And we're supportive of the D4K, and uh, but that that is the thing. Like as as a member of the KFA, you do come across this mentality. Many people, uh, you know, like this kind of hostile mentality. And lots of people always think that the D4K is the problem, and they actually never see that the US is the problem. And lots of times as well, when you're talking about South Korea, people have like this view on South Korea that they are some kind of advanced democracy, a capitalist democracy. Uh, but people are never talking. About like the issues in South Korea, let's say that they are failing. And Andreas, the, the sound, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, the sound's not great. So let me bring in Sukanda at, at this particular point. He's talking about um, it's not a democracy, which is what he likes and what, what you like in, in some ways, because you want a, a socialist state over there. Um, but it, KFA denies that there are concentration camps. It denies that there are violations of, of, of human rights. And if I could just remind you of something that you tweeted uh, five <laughs> years ago. It says North Korea is the best model country in the world for our youths. And it's got a, a tiny boy, probably about five or six, pointing a, a, a toy gun at a cartoon of, He's a, probably a, 40 of a US much. soldier. Yes, it's, it's somewhat tongue in cheek, but the point but there. What, what the, do you make of sure. what's going on there? But the, 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 the point Korea. there is who is, the provo who, who is doing the provocations here? There's 40,000 US troops on the southern side of the uh, South North Korean border. There's endless, we don't even know how many US nuclear weapons that are pointed at Pyongyang south of the border. So who is the real threat here? The Koreans want reunification. They want demilitarization of, of, their, of their nation. They want, they want reunification. And that was happening just a, a decade and a half ago. That there was reconciliation, there was a reunification of families, etc. Well, now, that was the sunshine policy. Exactly. Yeah. So, no, 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 Trump, but, but it the stopped. Trump... So, so why did it stop? Was it the south? Was it the north? Was it? See, so this, well, this... I think it was a mixture of things. I mean, the, 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 certainly the Clinton administration reached out to, to the north. There were the the, uh, the six party talks. The EU was involved. Um, there was a much healthier. Um, international attitude and I have to say also I think the Kim Jong-un regime is probably even more isolated or has managed to isolate itself even more than its predecessor I mean the Chinese are very concerned because they believe that they have no conversation at all with but the, the Chinese, this is what, but Mark, this is the Chinese have come in and said that 
to, to Trump that you're not going go to go, we're not going to have a war on Korea of conducted course. by you Absolutely. on no, our watch. Not, they push no, that back totally. There's no dispute about that. Of course, the Chinese do not want a war on the Korean Peninsula, are extremely anxious about the Trump administration. And we're not dealing, uh, sadly, with a, a, an administration, I think, in Washington, well, at the very, very top, that is thinking very carefully about all of these things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Chinese, no, of course they don't. But, the, um, but the, this, administ this regime in North Korea is incredibly isolated right now. And that makes it even more unpredictable and dangerous, and it also makes the Trump administration unpredictable and dangerous. Which, which is where we can go back to Andre Walker at this particular point. I mean, we've gone into why you think it's right to do something, but what do you think should be done? What do you think Donald Trump and his team probably will do? So, obviously, as you know, I've got some experience with the Trump team, and I think their view will be very simply this. Firstly, this idea that um, certain people on the political left are pushing around that the Trump team want to invade North Korea, I mean, it's, it's blatant nonsense. It's just a bit of propaganda. I think what they, will, what they will seek to do is this. They will seek to say, look, we find it completely unacceptable for you to have an intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile. How, and, and if you threaten Guam, we will threaten you back. However, we have no desire for regime change. Hey, keep it North short. Korea. Tell us what you think he's going to okay. do. I think he's going to say to, to, to Kim Jong-un, you do not need to cease to be leader in North Korea as, and we will not give you any trouble at all as long as you don't threaten LA with a nuclear missile. Mr. Sutton. Interesting. Well, I mean, that, that suggested a real degree of pragmatism uh, and, uh, and a, a lot of good sense. I mean, I have to say also that uh, in the ramping up of things the previous week, um, uh, some of the media reports were very irresponsible because I know that the language from the North was fiery, full of rhetoric, uh, it which is, is. Oh, oh, it, it always is, the Trump administration. But we have to face up that, although that the, and the report was very uh, interesting, but a lot of these, a lot of this missile technology is just not good enough. So it can't, they can't directly threaten the United States, I don't think. They can't directly threaten Guam. It's near to. All of this stuff would actually suggest it's just time to calm down and step back. And I think it's interesting hearing that from you. I just hope that, you know, over this particular period with all the military exercises that things which do is a, not Which get is a very uh, volatile one, one time. No, no, I'm going, I'm going back to Andreas. We, we, we're having difficulties, as you know, with the, with the sound quality, but we're going to give it one more go. Um, with your Korean friendship, Association. Uh, you promote the values, as you see it, of uh, what's happening in North Korea. But why do you think everybody else, sorry, not everybody else, so many other people, in your opinion, misjudge that country? It is because there's like a constant media campaign against the DPRK and it's, it's in, initiated by, by the West and South Korea mostly. You can see that for us in, in the media, for example, reading news about the DPRK, they are mostly like the taken from the South Korean sources. And of course, you have heard like all the ridiculous nonsenses about, let's say, uh, that free holding water. I I'm sorry, Andres, okay. we're going to have to leave it. It, it. it just isn't working. But look, we thank you for your time. Uh, let me put the point to you, Sukhan, here. I mean, there's a report from the United Nations at the moment that says um, food conditions are still pretty poor, not as bad as the famine in, in the, the 1990s. So the children under five, the main cause of death is uh, pneumonia, diarrhea. Uh, not malnutrition, but caused by malnourishment. Um, doesn't something need to change there as well? Perhaps let the, let, let the DPRK exist, remove the sanctions, normalize relations with it, remove the military. You know, all the whole, this whole situation reminds me of what Mao, Mao Zedong talked about, paper tigers. Trump is coming with such violent rhetoric and he's just got nothing to prove his rhetoric. And even leading commentators in the Western mainstream are saying he is actually totally exposing the weakness of uh, American military hegemony. Actually, some people, and these are Western uh, experts, are saying he, actually he's proven that US's military hegemony across the world has ended. He keeps threatening. He, he threatened China at the beginning of the year. He went right to the brink of the war with Beijing. Beijing said, come on, then let's have it. And then he bombed then, then, I mean, then, then some village in, uh, in Afghanistan yeah. with his biggest weapon. And it, and it is a little bit like, the, you know, the red line must not be crossed in Syria, mm. uh, the previous administration. And, of course, it was crossed and, uh, and nothing happened. The, I mean, there is another, related to that, another issue, which is, uh, we were talking about this earlier, which is essentially, it's not just about the nuclear issue. Uh, it's also about uh, conventional war. And the reason why I think that someone, even like Steve Bannon, says they're, well, but to be, uh, to be fair to him, I suppose he's been quite consistent about it, no military solution, is 
is that if there was a war, then the South and Seoul would be... I've, and I've been to... I've, I've from the North and the South, and I've seen, you know, the, 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 the military emplacements, and, and Seoul could be just destroyed in, in, in minutes. Well, the People South Korean this. president doesn't want this war. Exactly. He Japan does not don't want this, this war. They, Trump sent two, well, to two delegations to, to reassure them now. Yeah, <laughs> that's presumed there's going to be war. They do not want war. Absolutely right. And I think that they must have had some influence in Washington Absolutely. and I hate I mean this is my speculation and you may you may not agree with this but suddenly we did move the other week from this rhetoric about North Korea from both sides to suddenly talk about Venezuela and I couldn't help but thinking perhaps people said well Venezuela might be the easier option <laughs> either way all of this stuff is completely bonkers you've got to avoid all uh, <laughs> any military war because it could just uh, thermonuclear war on the Korean uh, yeah. peninsula? Something. Uh, Andre, it's still going to suggest that uh, if you're nice to North Korea, and I, I'm sorry, this is talking it right down. If you're nice to North Korea, North Korea <laughs> will be nice Not quite to you. But I mean, it, I, know, but I think you get no my problem, drift, don't no you? Problem, um, it surely it's down to the fact that, yes, if North Korea is nice, it's got to get rid of its nuclear weapons, and I don't know how that's going to be possible. I, th I think the big difficulty is um, that, look, this is one of the worst regimes in the world. The poverty is grinding. <laughs> the level of political freedoms is non-existent. You know, people are physically, apparently, a great deal shorter in South Korea than in North Korea than they are in South Korea because of the level of malnutrition. But ultimately, nobody wants a war on the Korean peninsula. Therefore, we have to come to some accommodation. Now, w the truth is, we don't know how good these... Uh, these uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles are, but nonetheless there is a direction of travel by the Kim regime, and that is towards threatening uh, the mainland United States. That is what we have to say is unacceptable. Alas, what we also have to say is your yeah. terrible, murderous, evil... Uh, well, I think you don't... Incompetent I don't regime, think you start off by saying that if you, if you want to have no. some sort of I mean, set of <laughs> negotiations. You use a different language. But I think, no, I think, no, I think you've got to be entirely honest. If you look at what Reagan did with the Soviet Union, he turned around and he said, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to pretend this is a good regime. We're going to tell you it's terrible, but we're Nothing also going to like tell you the there's not going to be a war. He, he, he never threatened a war, no, and, and also, but, I mean, I, no, no, I don't think... I, I think also that the... Uh, President Clinton, for instance, there was a... And during the Sunshine Policy, with Ban Ki-moon was one of the architects of that. I mean, there was... A, the North Koreans did stop the development of their nuclear programme because they were, the promise was that they were going to get uh, civil nuclear facilities. Did they sort of stop it? They sort of stopped it. But they were members of the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty. The nuclear facilities could be inspected. There are other countries, such as uh, Israel, for instance, that uh, refused to sign. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was a time, actually, in the not-so-distant past when North Korea and the EU was playing a very important role and the Clinton administration, they were beginning to get somewhere. Now, unfortunately, bits got derailed. Ultimately, though, I think, going back to your original point, the conflict ended, but there was never any peace agreement, final peace agreement. If you can get those direct dis dis negotiations between the US and North Korea, okay, maybe things will We've move. only got a few more minutes, and Andres, I'm going to have to excuse you on this one because the sound quality hasn't been good enough, but uh, we appreciate what you've had to say, so let me confine the, the conversation towards the end of the programme uh, to the table. Uh, what in particular about the personalities of the, of the two leaders, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, makes this perhaps more dangerous than ever before, or perhaps not? Well, Kim Jong-un has stayed consistent on the Songun policy of the Pyongyang uh, uh, regime or government, or whatever you want to call it. It's an army-first policy in, 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 in alliance with the party and with the masses. That's their policy. That's been the same since Kim Il-sung, since the 50s, right until today. And that's what they consider is their only safeguard to defending themselves against those... Ex I mean, the British and the United States have no right to pass judgment on Korea. You think he's quite stable when the suggestion is that he strapped one of his relatives to an anti-aircraft gun and then said, oh, sent somebody off to kill his partner. There's so many ridiculous stories that, that come out to be just ridiculous, the kind of tabloid stories oh. from South, South Korea that just, you know, doesn't help. But, but the, the Brits and the Yanks, they, they were directly complicit in the death of up to five million Koreas in three years in the early 50s. These people have no right to dictate or bully Korea at all. Pyongyang wants direct, uh, direct talks with Washington to resolve these issues, and that's what should happen, and that's what Beijing is demanding as well. You suggested in your article forward. six months ago um, that Donald Trump, and you've mentioned this, could be an architect for peace. Are you showing any signs of this? No, but you just don't know with him, do you? I mean, the Chinese will tell you that they, uh, they look at what he does each day and, and make judgments. It depends on his mood and his tweets. But I, I look, 
you would think that, he, that, tr that President Trump is surrounded by some quite sensible people and that he will have been advised not to do uh, anything that uh, could <coughs> Why would you think that? Well, because I always just, I'm one of life's optimists and live in hope. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I, I think we also have to be quite clear that, you know, the, the North Korean regime is a rotten, uh, despotic regime. And I've been there and I've seen the effects of famine and I've, been, and I've seen uh, orphanages and, and, and terrible suffering. But the reason why this regime has been able to survive so long and turn itself into this kind of weird, dynastic, Confucian yeah, uh, regime is because it's relied on the idea of the threat. John Foster Dulles used to talk about that in a different way. But, I mean, you rely on the threat. You remove the threat and you begin to move towards perhaps a rapprochement. The Koreans want to come together ultimately. Mm. They don't want it to come about through war and devastation because there'll be nobody left to appreciate the united Korea. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Andreas, um, um, Andrea, I was going to give you the last word, but unfortunately we've had to apologise for technical difficulties. Andreas, um, I hope you heard me. Uh, we appreciate yeah. what you're doing out there in Malta, but it just didn't quite work for us. Uh, Korean Friendship Association, check it out. I'm sure is what you would say to those people if you could. <laughs> Gentlemen at the table, thank you very much indeed. Uh, what we've been talking about is whether <clears throat> war between the north of Korea and the US is still a possibility or whether the, the two foes are going to keep each other at arm's length. That also depends on the two leaders of the two countries and the international community to some extent. You've been watching Roundtable. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion from me, David Foster, and the rest of the team. Thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.